Um, so um, I think that the first set of questions actually, um, and the question I had uh, thought about goes right um, after Andrew's last point, um, which is, um, and, and it's interesting that our last um, conversation this year is precisely about this question of college affordability. Um, but um, if, um, if the high cost of college is not um, going into tenure track um, faculty, then where the hell is it going? Um, now, uh, Barbara suggested a, a little piece of this in um, presidents and football coaches who belong to the 1%. Um, but I think there, there, there's, it's important perhaps to, to plumb this um, in, into some greater depth and I would ask um, all of the folks on the panel to do so with, with one illustration um, on my own part that, that I think was particularly telling. Um, my sister, um, who's a graduate of Grinnell College, told me um, that she had received a fundraising letter um, which announced that the college would no longer be able to do need-blind emissions um, because of the costs that they had invested um, in building uh, new housing. And apparently there is a trend around the country for colleges and universities um, to build quote unquote luxury housing um, to attract a certain kind of student. And th the thing that, that I think is particularly pernicious about that is that when I think back to 1971 when I miraculously convinced my father to send me off to Antioch College, um, that there was, a, there was a level of democracy about all of us being in these dorms um, where there was, they weren't dorms of great comfort, but they certainly took care of our basic needs of eating and, and um, you know, having a roof over our head and having heat in the winter. Um, and the notion that colleges and universities should have a class of students that can only live in luxury housing um, seems to me to, to really strike um, fundamentally at some of the democratic quality that uh, an institution of higher learning um, should have. And so, so I would ask you all to, to um, share with us your thoughts about um, uh, where the high cost of college education is going. We know that the largest sector of employment increasing on college campuses is in student services. So there has been a whole growth of a class of administrators on college campuses, some of whom are perhaps necessary given the uh, ever-increasing regulations on colleges, but many of whom are precisely in the service of the uh, luxury campus or the residential campus with all aspects that go with it. So college has increasingly become transformed into a uh, offering a complete experience to a student with all the kind of support that in the past might not be there. There's also the extreme expenses when technology is first rate and is uh, used across the board. So that, I think, is one aspect that, that explains a bit of it, but certainly not, not more than a bit. Do you have any thoughts? I, I don't have a thought, no. Mm -hmm. I, I would actually say that um, the rise in the number of people who have been hired in advising is in direct relation to uh, the lack of full-time faculty um, who would have, in the past, been able to uh, handle a lot of situations that advisors see right now. Um, I think it's true technology is, is quite expensive. Um, there's student services, and then there's administrative bloat. Um, we are, uh, you know, for our executives, for our presidents and vice presidents, uh, they they are now competing with uh, Wall Street because they don't feel that somebody who has been an educator their entire life has any business running a school. Um, 
And so you have situations where, well, there was, where was that, Maria, where there was a president who uh, was leaving, had a $400,000 salary, and there were four faculty members who, uh, who said that they were going to apply for the job together. Because of four, of course, four, four people could do that job better than any one person who they could possibly have, and especially they're in a university. And, and it turned out, you know, this was, they weren't serious, which I was sorry to hear, actually. Um, we are now, uh, how this has happened, you know, why, why are we being, why are we competing with Wall Street? I mean, is this really, what is this, where did that idea come from? And has that really helped us? I think it really needs to be examined again. Um, well, my employer, NYU, has, is very close to Wall Street, and <clears throat> most of the board of trustees uh, are very familiar with <laughs> the ways of Wall Street. So um, I feel I speak from within the belly of the beast. Um, but in answering your question, Leo, or whoever asked the question from the floor, um, I want to say that uh, it's, it's very, the, the term corporate university has is, is become a part of currency. It's a favorite term that's thrown around the academic water cooler by my colleagues quetching about their administration and others. And to some degree, yes, there, is, there are some similarities uh, trending, although there's a lot of two-way traffic between university cultures and especially knowledge corporations these days, you know, university campuses are the, are the model in many ways for, uh, for the campus of uh, knowledge corporations. So it's not just a one-way traffic. Um, <clears throat> but the biggest difference really is uh, administrative bloat, yes, the, the amassing of the ranks of administrative uh, employees mm -hmm. over the last 20 years or so. They now outnumber the number of full-time faculty in this country according to one estimate. And this is exactly the opposite of what goes on in the corporate world. Uh, corporations have been, um, have been focused on eliminating middle managers and administrators for the best part of two decades now to make their, you know, their organizations lean and mean. And the academy's gone in exactly the opposite direction. And for sure, perhaps there are, as Rosemary said, uh, some, some rationale uh, for some of these positions being created in, in answer to the demand for increased student services. But you ask any faculty person at any campus and they will, be, they will confess to being quite bewildered as to what most of the senior administrators do on a daily basis at their universities while pulling down massive salaries I mean, most of the focus is on the, you know, the charismatic, the uncharismatic megafauna, the, you know, the, the college presidents who have these bloated salaries, but it's the senior administrators and some of the middle administrators also, uh, whose salary inflation is really quite rampant. Um, the other thing I would just mention is, because no one else has, is about a capital intensive expansion, uh, building expansion on campuses across the country. Uh, and again, you ask anyone who's, a, who's an old hand on any campus, and they, they would give you chapter and verse about the number of buildings that are um, either redundant or replicating or buildings that are already perfectly uh, serviceable. And much of that is debt-fueled. I mean, much of it is, is part and parcel of this new political economy of, of, of universities, uh, which has made them, uh, especially if they're in metropolitan areas, has, has made them part of the urban growth machine. And that economic managers in cities increasingly depend upon the urban universities to be drivers of the urban economy. And that involves them in all sorts of uh, growth intensive uh, initiatives that are fueled by, hey, Wall Street. <laughs> uh, there's another important consideration and that's with public universities and uh, colleges, <laughs> which have uh, increasingly seen defunding and a disinvestment on the part of uh, state legislators. So a president at a flagship state university may very well make a million dollars, but take 900,000 away, and that doesn't go very far when the state has reduced its funding by 70% over a decade or two. Yeah, that was actually the next 
the next question, which which was the the role of s systematic um, disinvestment in public universities. We all know, for example, the story of the City University of New York that once provided an absolute quality education free of charge, um, and 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 what that provision did, I think, was was. Cre create some limits on the larger market, if you want, for universities, and to the extent to which um, now public universities have rising tuition because of disinvestment, um, you, you, the ability to 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 hold down the overall market, um, you know, I think is diminished. Um, it. Um, what might be what might be interesting in this regard, and and I'd be interesting to hear the panel's thoughts on this, um, is Obama's um, recent proposal to make community college, um, you know, basically f tuition free, not room and board as well, but tuition free. Um, not likely to get through this Republican. Congress, but is it a worthwhile marker to set down, and is this something that that we should be pushing for? Anyone? Didn't Andrew address that? Excuse me. Andrew addressed that. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Well, I I think it, if nothing else uh, that it, it's incredibly important that it's been introduced into the conversation, and uh, I. I don't think anyone completely uh, knows all the details about it yet, so it's uh, maybe a little bit hard to uh, to really uh, talk knowledgeably about it. Um, you know, obviously the intent is um, uh, it, the idea that government actually wants to get more involved in education is something to me, as a Pennsylvanian, is incredibly refreshing. <laughs> I have a, a few thoughts, some of which uh, people like Maria Maisto have already alluded to in the higher education press. There's uh, basically three things going on that deserve our attention. One, because adjuncts already do the great majority of teaching on community college campuses, the increase of students, the uh, free access to the uh, education uh, with no thought about bettering the working conditions of adjuncts will be a de facto worsening of those conditions. And then we also have two other factors. One is time to degree and the pressure that a free tuition program would bring to get students through. And then, and this affects us particularly in the humanities, it hits hard, the orientation is often highly vocational to get specific job training for a specific job outcome. And those of us in the humanities uh, and a, a general liberal arts education believe that education without a direct vocational track is worthwhile and that students should be allowed to pursue that kind of intellectual exploration without having to do so in two years and with a job in a particular vocational track as the stipulation for the free college. Andrew? Can I just add something? Um, I think that, uh, I mean, I cannot not applaud the president's uh, uh, announcement last week, but I think it was a missed opportunity to go much further. Because there are a lot of estimates in circulation about how cheaply um, uh, public education as a whole, public higher education as a whole, could be covered from the federal purse. Uh, the group I work with called Strike Debt, which is a debt resistance group, we have our own estimate of how cheap that would be. Uh, it's $12.5 billion a year um, to cover the tuition costs at every two and four year college in the country. And um, you can look at our website and look at how we got to that estimate, but in short, it involves stripping away all the current, it's a very long list of subsidies uh, that currently pertain to the federal loan system, um, which are massively inefficient in the view of these university economists that Barbara was railing against earlier. If you stripped all of those away and took out the, the GI Bill monies and the subsidies to the for-profit sector, which are just immoral, downright immoral, 
you're left with a bill of $12.5 billion a year, which is, you know, nothing. It's a, it's a line item in the, in the, in the defense budget. Uh, so Ob Obama's estimate, and I don't know how they got to this last week, was that it would cost $6 billion a year for to, you know, to cover 75% of the community colleges. I don't think that, I don't think that involved taking away those subsidies. So it could be even cheaper than that. Um, there's a, a question that um, um, points out that in the Temple and the United Adjuncts of Philadelphia material, the testimonials are coming predominantly from adjuncts in arts and the humanities. And it, it asks, um, can you speak to disciplinary differences and challenges? And and I think there's a related question that th certainly those of us in education know that schools of education have been treated um, in higher education as cash cows, um, taking in a great deal of, of student income and not um, having a commensurate expenditure, which, which is part of the, the challenge that they face in, in producing um, graduates that are prepared to teach. Um, but I think that there's a, also a question here that in a corporate university, um, are all parts of the university equally valued? And how does that play into the adjunct issue? Well, I can respond to uh, maybe probably why uh, most of the voices in that brochure uh, come from the arts and humanities has to do with uh, 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 the organizers, essentially. A lot of the people who, are, um, who have been organizing come from those fields, but we've found uh, a lot of support in the business school and sciences. Um, I don't think that it necessarily um, is reflective of, of the sport, of the work that, that we're doing. Okay. Well, Barbara. No, I think that, I, I don't know, this is my observation, and I'm an outsider, I've just been to a lot of campuses, and that the status gradient between something like law, or uh, not that it's a graduate program, between business majors and things like that, and sociology is tragic. You know, sociology is going nowhere, unless somebody can wants to contradict that, but all, so, huh, no? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's just, it, you know, I, it, it, it's, the, it's many of the kinds of things which interest me, although I was a science major years ago, um, they are, they are, they finished. Classics. Is that gonna hold on? How long is that gonna hold on? Um, philosophy. I, I don't I don't know where I, I you know I, I throw up my hands terrifying. Actually, enrollments in classics have been on the increase, so we, oh, at least we have okay. one one uh, bright spot. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Any thoughts on that? Okay. Um, w would unionizing part-time educators um, help restructure the business model of higher education? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but. Yes, but. But what? But the unions must be constructed in such a way that the uh, full-time faculty members and uh, tenure-track faculty members and the contingent contract part-timer are not pitted against one another. Um, I myself have heard this from many MLA members mm -hmm. who say that when they're in the same union, things go much better than when the unions are separate. I have no experience myself in that, but this is what my members tell me. Uh, anyway. Yeah, the one thing I would add is that, and we haven't really talked about the situation of full-time contract faculty. Uh, certainly in my university, that's the biggest growth sector in the workforce in the last uh, two decades or so, really the last 15 years, been phenomenal growth. And um, it kind of dates from the, the formation of the, of the adjunct union. Um, and, 
if you if you're being very cynical, you would you would conclude that this is an effort on the part of university management to um, uh, to prevent uh, new employees from joining a union because the uh, the contract uh, faculty don't have a union it's in the private sector, and um, and not only do they not have a union, but effectively they have no academic freedom or any any leverage in the workplace whatsoever. So the fact that they're the fastest growing sector um, and, and the analysis that this is an end run uh, around the part-time union or the, the adjunct union uh, is, I think, a lesson. And NYU is always on the front line of these neoliberal trends coursing through the academy. So it's probably a lesson worth looking at. Um, I mean, there's a solution, obviously, unionization, but it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a fraught one, of course, in the private sector, as we all know. One thing is for sure, though, when you read about some of the most egregious abuses of adjunct labor, a union of any kind will help prevent some of the, contra the kind of contract violations that we see, or yeah. in many cases, they don't have a contract. Some of these semester to semester working conditions that can be changed overnight, as we've been hearing. Uh, so I think um, a, a union can be helpful to protect basic rights as far as uh, salaries, raises, teaching assignments, and so on. You know, one of my one of my favorite quotes is uh, in organizing is from Barney Frank. And he said, he said, um, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> and and I think that uh, you know, it, we are being our schools are being run as businesses. And until we have a voice, until we're at the table, then uh, this is our condition. So that it's, it make it does make a tremendous difference. Okay. Um, there's a question um, that goes off um, of your statement, Jenny, that adjuncts don't show poverty to students or peers. And I guess, you know, this has its roots in kind of feelings of shame that somehow um, in this country, if we're poor, it's a consequence of our own actions and not uh, a, a larger social and economic forces. And it asks, should they? Isn't it actually necessary um, to have the kind of public discourse that we need um, for people to say, I'm an adjunct and I'm living in poverty? Sure. I mean, well, I mean, I, I, I always try to bring this up if I'm talking to col uh, edu uh, college students say, uh, how many are you have teachers who are adjuncts? Well, usually they don't know. It's true. Mm -hmm. And then I say, you know, just, well, next time they, you have a good class, would you tip her? You know, <laughs> something's got to be done. Because I don't think it's, it has, it, it doesn't occur to me, but I think the pedagogically correct thing to, for adjuncts to do is come to class in tatters, rags. <laughs> <laughs> Pass a cup around us with its student. You know, it's <laughs> well. It's a personal thing, and I think that there are adjuncts who who uh, who do um, open up their lives to their students and to other people in their community. Um, I think you know there's an upcoming event. Some anonymous person at some point on the internet proposed that there should be a national adjunct walkout day, um, and uh, mm. the idea has caught on, even though it hasn't been. Um, it was announced. Hasn't been. It hasn't been uh, necessarily, uh, it wasn't any organization that's behind this. Uh, but it's gotten to the point where basically organizations are, are paying attention and everyone, I, I believe, is, is trying to figure out what to do. Um, I think, you know, a lot of adjuncts don't want to walk out. Um, everyone is, I think, different schools are deciding how they're going to deal with it. But I, I've heard that some places are just even asking their adjuncts to um, have a day in class where they talk about themselves, where they talk about mm -hmm. labor, where they talk about their concern for their students and their student loans. Um, so uh, this is, uh, you know, these sorts of discussions might become uh, more common very soon. To follow up on something Barbara said, often we don't know how many adjuncts there are on a campus in a specific department or program. There's a couple ways to find out. 
Uh, one, if you go to the MLA website, we've set up an academic workforce data center using Department of Education data, and you can put in any institution and see that uh, pattern, the patterns, those data historically. Uh, the Coalition on the Academic Workforce, which is at workforce.org, has done departmental surveys. We've done two of them, and they will give you some in-depth information. And then the Humanities Indicators Project, and I uh, see two of our colleagues here who know a lot more about the project than I do, at um, indicate what's humanitiesindicators.org also offers a wealth of data. Uh, in these teach-ins that adjuncts do, but that all faculty should be doing. This should not fall on the shoulders of adjuncts to educate our students and our colleagues about the conditions on campus. It's incumbent on all faculty members. Uh, we can use these data because showing the numbers hits home in a way that not knowing certainly can't. The numbers coupled with stories such as the ones Jenny referred to, really paint a picture, and I think these teach-ins are an excellent way to do that. Um, so, so one last question, which is um, to ask you all um, to, to think perhaps about the difference between K-12 educators and higher education educators in this regard. Um, the, the fact that um, um, despite the best efforts of um, everyone from Wall Street hedge funders um, to Walmart, um, K-12 still has the strongest union density of any major um, sector of the economy, um, has meant that efforts to undermine the labor market standards there ha have largely been limited to charter schools. Um, and you don't have a phenomena of part-time um, K-12 um, educators in, in any meaningful way where there is a, a collective bargaining um, agent and, and representing um, the educators. Um, and just if, 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 if you would like to comment on that and if that says something about um, the, a presence of a much stronger union presence in higher education is, is really what's needed um, to deal fundamentally with the problem of the precariat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I leap a little bit tangentially sure. about that? Just this is something I, I wanted to um, uh, pick up on and add into this. I, I like the way Andrew put it, you know, college is a debt trap. You know, we have a right to education, we have a right to access loans with which to get an education and so on. Um, you, it, put somewhat cynically, there is a problem here. How do you educate people for a life of debt? And I began to think about this when it uh, came on um, my radar that K, the K-12 grades are increasingly offering um, courses in financial literacy. Uh, courses on mine, managing your finances. Uh, and that is, that's been a big kind of push among poor people, too. Let's just teach them how to manage their money. Uh, how you manage $6 an hour or an adjunct pay, I don't know. But um, so that there, I think there is a perceived issue about how do we um, train people into debt, because that's really what goes on. And he's financially, shut up, um, this financial literacy programs. I, I remember um, being at um, a, 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 a luncheon sponsored by a, a group in uh, Houston that uh, does financial literacy training for low-income people. And it seemed benign enough to me until um, I was introduced to many of the funders who were all there for the reception part, mm -hmm. and they were like Bank of America, mm -hmm. Wells Fargo. Yeah. And that's when the suspicion was born into my mind that what is really going on is you have to take people young, and to, at a young age, to understand this is how you're going to live. Now, I never got the memo. I never got the lesson. Mm. 
and you know persist in that ancient uh, kind of man mindset that debt is a thing to avoid. But now they're taking, you know, like in the sixth and seventh grade, uh, let's have a cl let's find out what an APR is. Right. Why? I mean, I don't know. But um, the 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 idea you, ha you have to start early, and it goes on. A college education. I once wrote a satirical sort of article about this that. You know, whatever else you get out of college, you get you get training in being a debtor. You know, you find out quickly what in, how to figure out the, the interest rates and this and that. And I think this is a, a this is a pedagogical challenge for um, as perceived right. by the powerful. Yeah, and I, I think I think just to add to that, the progressive corollary to that. <coughs> is that that kind of financial literacy has to include a demand for fiscal transparency. And this is where, in, in response to the last question, this is why the teachings, I mean, I, I, I've done a lot of these, and I've talked a lot to students about the political economy of their institution, and it often leaves them feeling more powerless than before. Sure. And that's why it has to include this, this appeal to their right to demand fiscal transparency of the institution. And their families and themselves, they're paying this tuition through by hook or by crook, and they don't know how the money is being allocated. And a lot of the key to this uh, financial literacy is to direct the consciousness in that direction, to insist on the right for full fiscal transparency, because even in public colleges, where in states where there are sunshine laws, uh, budgets and allocations are not fully transparent. And as for the private sector, forget it. Nothing is transparent whatsoever. Um, so that, that, that should be a major component of this. And it's only at that point that you have all the figures and facts at your command that you're able to say, well, is this about fiscal efficiency or is it about uh, control over the workforce, or is it about uh, satisfying the creditors, or what? Um, and students can get involved in that discussion because they feel that their family income is, Im they have skin in the game, that their family income is implicated in it. And it makes them feel less powerless, I think, when you mm -hmm. give them a right that they didn't know that they had to insist upon. I think also in um, response to your question, Leo, that yeah, uh, of course, you know, having uh, organizing in higher ed is uh, is critical. But I also think that um, we're organizing a new type of person. I mean, we are talking about, especially with adjuncts, with the precariat. I mean, it's very different than, uh, you know, this is something new. And I think what's exciting right now is trying to figure out. Uh, what it's going to look like. It's not necessarily going to look like, a, you know, K through 12 mm -hmm. model. And uh, this is something that, you know, uh, that is being formed as it's happening. And uh, that's, uh, so yes, I mean, I think it's important. It's just, but I, in, a, in a funny way, I, I think that you could compare them, maybe. I, I think they'll be very different. Okay, I'm going to, I just got one, promise one last question, folks, um, which is what is the proper role of professional and disciplinary organizations, I guess this is your question, Rosemary, in advocating for better working conditions for their contingent workforce? And, and why do so many um, organizations, I'll, I'll say like my own political science association, um, seem to emphasize scholarly association and tenured faculty over advocating for adjuncts and part-timers? Well, this is why we need sociology, because a sociological study of scholarly and academic associations would reveal some interesting historical patterns. Associations like the Modern Language Association, which was founded in 1883, uh, have origins as a scholarly association. That was almost their exclusive purview uh, well into the 20th century to bring scholars together to share research and finding and to promote the teaching and the study of our fields. Now, with 
the somewhere in the 40s, 50s, the Modern Language Association started to pay a lot more attention to issues around teaching, around um, especially uh, government funding where relevant to the humanities, and began to take on not only much more of a professional scholarly association characteristic, but a professionalizing one in which the association provides for its members resources, not just in scholarship and teaching, but also in preparing for the uh, job search and facilitating the job search and so on. Now, in most scholarly associations and uh, the, all of the ones we're talking about, American historical, American political science, are uh, identified as uh, scholarly associations. The primary thrust, though, on scholarship and teaching must be and is connected as well to academic workforce advocacy. This is why the association has a department of research and works with other associations to provide the kind of analysis that we see. We also feel that it's important to provide tools to our members so they can advocate on their campuses. We feel it's important to come to events in DC and to get the word out. Interestingly, and I imagine this is true for the historians, the political scientists, the percentage of our members who are themselves in contingent faculty positions doesn't look at all like the percentages in the profession. So the new faculty majority on campuses is still the faculty minority in our associations. So therefore, I think we're seeing over time a new balance, a shift in balance, where the contingent faculty members in an association such as ours have been doing a lot more of the work of the association. They're on our executive council, they're on our committees, they are active, they are responsive, and they are forging a place in the disciplinary associations with support from up to the council, the governing board, to all the way to the way we organize sessions at our annual convention. The one thing, though, that has to be said over and over is, we wish that the disciplinary organizations could go on campus and change the curriculum where appropriate, change the salary where appropriate, form unions and other activities that need to happen on a campus level or in a um, union organizing level. So our work as advocates, researchers, analysts, and informing coalitions goes a great extent, but the on-campus work that is the responsibility of every tenured faculty member, as well, obviously, as um, uh, those who are advocating for themselves, that work is supported by the MLA, but cannot be usurped. So that's, I think, and it's, and it's delicate. It's a delicate balance as we go on from um, a purely advocacy association to a purely scholarly association. And I think uh, the MLA among scholarly associations has been one of the um, most active, but we still have a long way to go in that regard. Okay. Thank you. And I'd like to thank our, our panel today, um, Rosemary, Barbara, Jenny, and Andrew. Um, I think it's been a, an incredibly informative, if somewhat bleak, <laughs> Um, analysis. Um, reality can be a downer at times, um, but I'm sure that everybody here um, is leaving with a far better understanding and grasp of the issues around the precariat in education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.